right, everybody, let's go ahead and dive in and get started. My name is Hank Preston, and welcome to this episode of Net DevOps Live. Joining me today is Stuart Clark, one of our network automation experts here in Cisco DevNet, and he'll be talking to us today about managing network configurations with the Python automation frameworks of Napalm and Nornir. As always, if you have any questions during the session, please use the Q&A panel. We'll be handling those both during the Q&A panel as well as potentially live during the session. Stuart will be covering some of those as well. And as always, if you're looking for the slides, code samples, or other webinar resources, they're posted up on the NetDevOps Live website under the webinar resources for this episode. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Stuart to dive right in for us. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Hank. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this awesome session that we've got planned for you today. This is Managing Network Configurations with Python Automation Frameworks, Napalm, and Nornow. I am Stuart Clark, Network Automation Evangelist with Cisco DevNet. So let's jump straight in here and just go over the game plan of today. So what are we going to talk about here? First, we're going to talk about what is Napalm. Then we're going to move on to how Napalm can be used on our network devices, and then we're going to look and retrieve some information from our devices and configure our devices through gathering facts and configuring our network with Napalm. Once we've worked through all of those Napalm examples, we're going to move on to Nornaya. And then we're going to drive Nornaya through Python code, and we're going to see some Nornaya examples as well. I am going to pause throughout this presentation, so if you've got any questions uh, throughout the presentation, please feel free to put them in, in the room, and we'll answer them as, as we're going along. So let's jump into this right now. So a little bit about Napalm just before we start. Napalm stands for Network Automation and Programmability Abstraction Layer with Multi-Vendor Support. So I'll challenge anybody to try and say that three times fast. First of all, it's a Python library that can be used to implement a set of functions to interact with different network devices operating systems using an a, a unified API. So what makes this special about having this as a unified API? So First of all, the thing that you need to do with Napalm, with it being a Python tool, is to install it. And we put, it's published to Py, PyPy. And we can install it like we do most of the Python packages just using the pip tool. You'll see the example on my screen there. So the first thing you have to do is to make sure you've got uh, pip installed and you can verify this with pip dash dash version to see the uh, pip version. And then just go ahead and pip install Napalm. If you have to use sudo to do that, then sometimes you do. And then you'll see Napalm nicely, nicely installed on your machine. And what you'll see is there at the bottom is all the sort of the different components that is used to uh, help Napalm run and all the things that it uses to, to gather the information and help configure our devices. So I spoke in the uh, slide when we was talking about this being a, um, a unified API. And a unified API is really cool because you can configure multiple devices of different sorts of hardware flavors, XR, NXOS, um, iOS, different vendors like um, Arista and, and, uh, and Juniper with Junos, and you can use the same code. And the only thing that really changes across here is the different types of drivers which are used to interact with the devices. Here on the top column, you'll see the different sort of driver names which we use in our code iOSXR, uh, NSOX, NSOX SSH, which is a relatively new one for Napalm, iOS, now this covers the sort of standard iOS and it also covers um, iOSXE if you're wanting for XE devices, and then you've got EOS and, and then Junos. There's a slight difference in the way that the data is structured. So with XR you don't get structured data, but yet with Napalm, uh, sorry, with Nexus you do, and then you don't get that with iOS and you do with ESOX and, and Juniper. And there I've highlighted the minimum version of code that you need to uh, run Napalm with across your, across your devices. So minimum version for XR, which we'll be using today, is 5.10. NextOS is 6.1, that's the same for NSOX, SSH. iOS is 12.4, and then so on through EOS and, and, and Junos. And then right at the bottom there, you'll see the backend libraries. We'll see a little bit of the backend libraries when we go into the code there for how the actual devices or Napalm in, interacts with the devices themselves. And I have just put a little caveat just in the bottom there for NX API and the support of the uh, 5K, 6K and families were introduced in 7.2 of NXOS. 
However, the SSH driver will support earlier versions of NXOS and use unstructured data if you wanted to know the difference. There are a couple of things you have to enable to make this work on certain devices, kind of like a, a prerequisite, if you will, that you have to put on your devices to make this work. But I will cover that in one in the upcoming in the upcoming slides and demonstrations for those of you interested in that. So let's look first of all at Napalm data gathering. A big job as your network engineer or an engineer is you want to get information from your devices. And here I'm going to show you what happens is, is you run the Python code. We send a get request out to our device. That information is then pulled from the running configuration and the details are then provided back to the host, which is running on your local machine. And that's how we gather the data back from uh, with using uh, Napalm for data gathering. For Napalm uh, deployment and operations, first we run the Python code. The code is then generated. This is then sent into the candidate configuration file on the box. That is then checked and validated to see if it is actual, you know, legitimate uh, configuration file. If you had an error in, in a configuration or something like that, the code would then be rejected and it wouldn't be able to be configured on the device. Similar to if you made a mistake typing something into the CLI, for example. That's then uh, merged or replaced into the running configuration and the changes are then applied and confirmation is then sent back to the host to say that those uh, changes have been made. So here we're going to look at what you can do with Napalm and I've labeled this part one because there is around five, six different things. The first thing that we're going to look at is the configuration replace and the replace will replace the entire running configuration with a completely new configuration. Now this is great if you want to have all of your running configurations based off a, a predefined template and you want them to all be the same. So this is another great way of eliminating those snowflakes on your, on your running devices, on your network uh, and then you're going to keep a consistent state. Say, for example, somebody goes in, SSHs into the device, puts in a quick static route or a cheeky ACL just to get around a hot fix. When you did your configuration plate and you uh, replace and pulled this from your uh, templatized um, configuration, that would come up quite quickly because it wouldn't be in your base configuration. The alternative to doing the configuration replace is the configuration merge. And this is where you merge a set of changes from a file into the running configuration. The difference here between the replace and the merge is the merge is only going to push sections and certain sections. Now this could be your BGP configuration, interface configuration, security areas like NTP, SNMP, um, NTP or something like that. I get often asked, well, when do I use the difference here? When do I know when to use replace and when do I want to use merge? The only real answer to that one I can give you is, is if you own the entire running configuration of your device, you want to use the replace. However, if for example, your job is to monitor peering sessions or your, your part of your role is to monitor peerings or IXs or interconnects or something like that, and you're adding constantly, say, new BGP pairs all the time or removing them from the running configuration, you would want to consider using the merge configuration because the only real sections you're going to be changing there is, say, adding new BGP neighbors with match prefixes, or MD5 um, passwords or something like that for different pairings. That is just an example. You may want to be just using merges for doing, I don't know, ACL changes or usernames or something like that. You do have to look into a little bit as to which option there is going to work best for you. My strongest recommendation is to use the configuration replace file. It just so it eliminates the snowflakes across your devices. We have this really, really neat option within Napalm called configuration compare. And what configuration compare will do, it will compare your new proposed configuration file with the running configuration on the device. We saw this on the previous slide. And so whether you're doing the configuration replace where you're replacing the entire running configuration file or whether you're doing the merge, you can have Napalm come back and we will see this in a little bit. 
come back to you and say, uh, this is the um, this is the changes. I have actually got a little caveat there written at the bottom. This only applies to configuration replace operations. It does not apply to merge. You can actually alter the code, your Python code to actually do that, to give you and show you that diff file. This is something that I like to do, as we'll see a little bit later on. But as a rule, uh, the uh, configuration repair is only on the default replace. So moving on to part two, where we look at the uh, final three options. We have the discard, and the discard is really cool here. So what we're going to do with the discard is we're going to revert the, conf uh, revert the candidate configuration file back to the current running configuration file, reset the merge configuration file back to the empty file. So what does this mean? If you are, say, for example, pushing out some ACLs or NTP or BGP here, you will see the diff or the changes come up onto your screen to see this is the differentiator between what you what we have on the device and whether we're adding or we're removing. I always like to eyeball my changes just before I make them. So and we'll see this a little bit later on is that once you've made your changes, you will see the diff come up on the screen and you'll be able to validate whether those are the changes you wish to make. You then get the option then to actually discard those changes before this is actually pushed into the running configuration. This part of the configuration is actually stored in the candidate file. So it lives in a candidate and then the candidate is then committed into the running file of the device, which is pretty neat. Finally, if we're happy with our changes, we can deploy the stage configuration from the candidate, which can be either be the new file for the replace operation or the merge file. And this is done via the commit. And this really goes around to, you've made your changes, You've had a quick eyeball of, yep, yeah, this is the changes I want to make to my device. And then you can commit them. And then what that will do is it will commit those changes then into the running configuration of the device. There, and your changes are made. However, we do have it here, the rollback. And this is a great feature. This reverts the running configuration back to a file that was saved prior or to the previous commit. Let's go through the workflow one more time there. We push the changes to the device. We get the chance to eyeball them and we don't discard them. We then commit them. While we're in the commit stage and it's actually gone into the running configuration file, we could then perform some testing. Now we could do something like a simple ping test or a simple ACL test, or we could log into the device and check our changes are made, traffic's passing or something like that, however we're planning our changes. Let's just say, for example, that the changes all of a sudden started to bring some alarms onto your network. Your, your network monitoring all of a sudden went a little bit red or the person next to you asked you if you were making changes because they saw some anomalies on your network. You had then have that option to roll back that configuration that you've just made and put it back to the configuration that you had before you made the changes. As many as you will know, this has been a strong feature within ISXR for a number of years now. And the question I often get asked is, well, that's great because we know XR does that, but can we do this on, say, iOS XE and, and plain iOS, or could we even do this on Nexus? And the answer to that one is yes, you can. If you're doing this on iOS or iOS XE, you can enable this by using the archive feature. The archive feature will store up to 10 uh, prior running configurations by default, and you can increase this, but this is platform specific. In Nexus, you have to um, put this in the same sort of manner and you have a, a, a checkpoint file. So you create checkpoints on your device so that when your device rolls back, it goes back to a previous checkpoint. And you do this by enabling uh, the checkpoint feature on the Nexus devices. So that's really cool. So that's kind of the f uh, five, six things that you can do with Napalm. So the bit that everybody wants to see is the Napalm demo. And here we're going to look through all of the um, examples and the pieces that I talked about in the previous slides and see how this is structured and see how this is working. So hopefully you can all see my screen there. Now I've got two screens running here. The one on the left hand side, as you'll see, has all of the code and all of the examples I'm going to run today. And on the right hand side of the screen here, I'm using a simple vagrant box uh, with an XR image. 
If you want to know more about Vagrant, we have a super learning lab on Vagrant over in the uh, DevNet Learning Labs and with some sandbox as well, where you can learn all about Vagrant there. So for now, let's just log in to my uh, box. There we go. And so I've just logged into my box, which is running on my local machine. Now, let me just expand that out just a little bit. So the first bit of code that I want to run here is called get facts plain. So I'm going to run Python, get facts uh, plain. And I am using um, argparse here. If you're not familiar with argparse, argparse is a command line argument, which are um, flags, which are th they're built into the script to run at the time uh, to contain information about the script or the program to execute. In this particular device or this particular scenario, when I'm testing against either one of our sandboxes or something in viral or vagrant device, I don't often hard code the IP address into my Python code. The reason for that is I might want to run this against a different device, which I'm running, which has a, um, say, a different code train or something like that on it. So I never really put the um, IP address into the code. In this case here, what I'm going to specify is uh, localhost here. So that I'll run here on my on my um, from my machine to the uh, Vagrant instance of ISXR, and let's run that. Give that a second. Perfect. This is exactly what we wanted to see. So you'll see here that when we've executed this, we've got this nice little message from Pi ISXR giving us an exception and an error. And it's telling us that the XML agent is not enabled. When we talked about the different operating systems a little earlier, we talked about some of the prerequisites that you have to have enabled. With XR, you do have to configure XML agent TTY alliteration off. Going over to the, um, the documents for this, we see that by disabling this off means the entire XML response is returned regardless of its size. It does say use the use of this option is not recommended. However, I have run this in many production environments and it is pretty safe to run. So what we need to do is we need to go over to our, our, our device and we have to actually add this one line of, of syntax. So let's do that real quick and then we'll see the difference. So I'll just go into configuration mode, add that in there, commit. Just check that's fine. There we go. Minimize that window. Okay. Now we've added that line of syntax. Let's run that one more time. There we go. And what do we see? Well, what we're doing here is we're pulling a get facts on the device. This is similar to a, a get version. And this is why the unified API works across so many different devices. Now, it wouldn't matter if I was running this against XR, XE, or Nexus, or Junos, or EOS. By running the get facts um, within the napalm code, you can pull back all of this information. So the only thing that would really change here is just the driver. And you would still pull back all of this information. Here we will see that in this entire, kind of print it out in this entire big dictionary. And you'll see the vendor of Cisco, the iOS version, host name, uptime, serial number, if you've got a DNS name, the model and that kind of stuff. This is great. However, for the human eye, if, as this was expanding, if we was doing this for something like interfaces or a large, say a BGP configuration, it can be a little heavy on the eyes to read. So we need to actually make this look a little bit prettier. Um, just before we do that, let's take a quick look at the, um, the code that's made this work. And I, I did call this uh, getFacts underscore plain. And I'll just make this a tiny bit bigger. There we go. So on the Python code, we import Napalm and we import the section called um, uh, getNetworkDriver.
and that's what we want we want the driver from napalm you can see as i mentioned that we're importing argpass here and here's the section of argpass here specifying the different flags and that i want the ip address of the device to actually uh, make this work at runtime here in the driver section we have get network driver and we have ios xr if this was ios or uh, nexus this is where you would specify the change i have hard coded the username for vagrant here um, for those of you who don't want to do that you don't have to do that you can have your secrets come in from a secret store or something like this uh, for a, a production environment and you'll see here for the optional args pass because i am using a vagrant instance and i am mapping ports a little bit differently where the ssh port of 22 is mapped to uh, 2221 here I am using the optional logs to specify the port as well. We then open the device. We issue the get fax from Napalm. Napalm goes to the device and gets the fax and brings that back. We then, as good citizens, close the uh, session to the, to the device. And then we ask uh, for Napalm basically to print that out. And that's what we're presented with. But as I mentioned, that isn't really keen on the human eye. So if we pass this out to make it look just that little bit neater, and I just ran my script which says, get facts. I'm printing this out in a slightly better format, one that is a little bit more readable to the human eye. And here you'll see exactly the same information as what we saw because we're still running the get facts from Napalm, but we're just making it look a little bit more prettier. So let me show you how we achieve that. Exactly the same from the top, importing Napalm, args pass, the network driver, username, password, port, all still remains the same. However, here I am printing that Napalm is running um, I've got the dictionary there to get the facts and then within that I create the for loop here to then actually make this and print this into a much nicer format. You can do a much similar thing by just using uh, JSON or however you want to print it. But in this instance without um, importing JSON, I'm just doing it in this manner just to print it out in something that's a bit more human readable. And that prints it across the board. And as I said, if you wanted to change this, you could just update here and run this against XE. This becomes really, really powerful. If all of your devices are stored in something like um, an IPAM tool or a CMDB, you wouldn't even have to specify the driver. By the time the uh, script had gone, up, gone away to your um, CMDB or your IPAM device, it would pull the information back from there, such as the IP address, maybe your passwords, and even the driver type. So when you start to build this out at some, some scale and you're scaling this to you know, multiple devices and different uh, platforms, different vendors even, you can have this all stored you know, off, the, off out of the code. So it doesn't even have to need to be in the code. This example here, because I'm running it against one device and I like to change this and run this against multiple flavors of devices like XC and XR and Nexus, I keep everything pretty much local so I can just update the drivers and run the code depending on which platform I want to use. So that's how we pull information back using Napalm, which is really cool. And you can gather information about there to find out your OS versions and things, and you can pass all those different information pieces out. And you can use different get uh, requests from the devices which are built into Napalm to pull information back. Sections like interfaces, BGP, NTP, SNMTP, or users or something. All of these features are supported across multiple devices, but it is always best just to check the Napalm documentation to make sure that the GET request that you're running to that device is fully supported. As we know from moving from different CLI from operating systems, some CLI commands on XR might not be supported on Nexus, and this is true when you're running the same code. The code doesn't automatically get around those issues for you. So do check the GET requests are actually valid or check them when you're running against the devices and building your code. So let's look now at how we would do, um, say, a, a configuration of a device. So what I want to do now is I want to add some loopbacks to my device as a simple example. 
So let's just look for the code I want to run. And it's that one. So I run Python. Napalm loopbacks. Add the IP local host. And let's run this. And we'll see what it does. Cool. So when we talked a little bit about the diff before and wanting to eyeball the changes, you'll see the changes here which have the little plus in front of them. This tells us the changes which are going to be made to our device. And I have here written at the bottom, type commit to commit the configuration or hit enter to abort. The reason why I've got the raw input as typing commit here, I want to eyeball my changes before I make them. And having just a simple enter to make the commit changes for me is a little bit too risque. So I want the user who, or myself who is ever running the script to actually have to think about what they want to type into the, into the next command here to get this to commit. So now this will be in the candidate configuration file. And as we press commit, we get the little prompt to say that this has been committed. So now I'm just gonna quickly hop back over to my device, do a show IP in brief, and then we'll see that the two loopbacks are there. That's pretty cool. And you can see that that happened relatively quickly as well. The next question is, what happens if I was to run this again? What do you think would happen? So let's just do that. No change needed. Interesting. Napalm has gone into the device and it's looked at the changes that we were wanting to make and then it's identified that those changes are already there. So we refer to this as idempotency, which proves that Napalm is idempotent here. And now this is a merge change. And let's have a look at this on the code. So we want to look at Napalm loopbacks. We go through the arg pass again. We open the device. And here you can see on line 30, I'll highlight that here, we load merge candidate. And what I'm doing is I'm loading in a simple CFG file. Then I'm prompting this to run the diffs. As before when we mentioned that by default um, the diff doesn't show unless you're doing the replace. So I'm actually forcing Napalm to actually show me that diff so I can eyeball the change that I want to make. And we do this by the device compare config which is again built into Napalm. I'm then printing the diffs out and you can see here why I've got the type commit to commit the configuration or hit enter to abort. I do have, I often write exceptions into the code just in case there's an error. Remember when we talked about merging the configuration from candidate and it checking to see if it was valid? Well here, just, in, just so I have actually something printed against my screen to show that something has gone wrong, I may have, um, in this case, got my mask wrong. I may have just put 255, 255, 255 and forgot to add the zero on the end of it. Or I may have, you know, it just missed off or incorrectly typed the IP address wrong in this example. Here, the exception would come up and say that something had happened with the commit rather than just the code failing. So it's always nice to write these little errors scripts with actually within the code itself. Once that's been validated, we go through the config committed here, which was printed to the screen, or there's the exit where the script was aborted. If I press exit on line 37, and there here you'll see we've got the L final else statement here where no ch uh, changes are needed for when Napalm looked at the device and saw that this configuration already exists. And then finally, as a good citizen, we close the device. And that's how the code works, right running through this using the um, merge configuration here on line, uh, line 30. I'll show you that CFG file because it's really simple. The CFG file, I'm just using a CFG. You could just use a text file um, to have this here and you'll just see the standard configuration which is very familiar to us as network engineers. Well, I have the interface uh, for the network um, loopback for loopbacks 100 and 200. You can also use things like 
ginger templating to push your uh, changes to your devices and have that merge into the configuration as well. But for the example here, I'm just using a simple CFG file. So that's talking about um, merge configurations. What I want to show you now is the full replace. And we run that in exactly the same manner. So I'm just going to do Python uh, and it's replace loopbacks here. Use the args pass and let's run that. And what this is going to do is this is going to replace the entire running configuration file. Before it does that, I have actually had a diff here where I'm actually changing my IP addresses of the loopback. Otherwise, if I ran this um, with the same uh, configuration file, because of the odd impotency of Napalm, and I will run this again, you will see that it wouldn't make any changes. So the file that I'm actually loading in now here, as you'll see, I'm just changing the loopbacks in the third octet to 100 instead of 1. And you can see that in the diff output on the left hand side. I think due to the version of ISXR that I'm using, the pluses and the minuses get a little bit mixed up on the left hand side and it puts these hashes in here just for the changes I'm making. But I believe that's been fixed in a later version and might only appear in the Vagrant one that I'm using today. So do I want to commit this? Yes, and I'll just simply type commit. My configuration has now been committed. Let's hop back over here. You can see the loopback IPs from the merge configuration there were 111100, uh, 111200. Now let's issue the um, show IP in brief again, and we can see those have changed to how we wanted them to change. And this is by pushing the entire configuration. So let's see how this one's done in the code. It's just got a slight difference to it. Uh, it's uh, I can see it. So I've got my configuration file here. And basically the way that I built this is I had the, the entire running configuration of the device. And here you'll see the uh, loopback interface is 100 and 200 that we made the, ch the changes to the device. The best advice I can give you if you are going to do full replaces is that once you've built your baseline configuration, such as your management IP and some of the features that you'll need to get into the device, use this as your base template. You're then guaranteed to actually get the full running order of the device of um, what Napalm will try to do to the device itself. If you try to create something like this by hand, it can be a little bit of an arduous task where you're going back and forth with the device trying to get things in the running order. You don't necessarily have to have, say, interfaces at lines 12 and 15 or that part of the running configuration. If I cut and pasted those and moved those further down into this comp file, it would actually still accept those. But as we know from our network engineering experience, they are things which need to serve first to be a prerequisite before we enter them on the device. <clears throat> so what I wanted to look at was the uh, replace loopbacks. Exactly the same sort of stuff all the way up there. Except for, remember when we got to line 30, we had load merge candidate? Well, here we have load replace. It's as simple as that. And I'm then replacing that file that I showed you before, the conf file. We still run the diffs. And now this should be starting to look a little bit familiar to you, where we actually then compare the diffs. We have the commit to abort. We have um, the exception here in case we had any errors with the running configuration. And then this goes straight through. And again, right at the bottom here, we have the, if there's no changes needed, I'm actually printing that there's no changes needed. So I will run that just one more time. So Napalm is running. No change required. So it's taking that full comp file and comparing it to the one that we've already got on the box. And it's comparing the two together and it decides, no, we don't need to replace this. Cool, that's really cool. Okay, so for the final example here, as we mentioned up in the slide, um, you can do the rollback thing. So now let's put, we had the uh, interfaces at 100 in the third octet 
let's put those back to um, 111, uh, 100 and, and, and 200. Uh, and let's see the rollback feature in option. So LS, LA, let's have a look. So Python, I've named that um, rollback. IP local host. Let's kick that off. <clears throat> so I'm going to just hit the commit here, and you'll see on the left hand side we've got the negative and the positive here, meaning we're going to change the 100 back to 1 for, for loopbacks 100 and 200. Now I'm just going to press commit. And now we're prompted by this rollback feature. So I'm just going to jump quickly onto the box. Remember the last commit that we had, or the last show IP in brief here, was actually showing me 100, 100. So this has actually been commi committed on the box, show IP in brief, and indeed it has actually gone back to 111, uh, 100 and 200. Let's say for example, everything changed. So I'm actually gonna roll this back and I'm gonna type rollback. Configuration reverted. So now it's undone the changes. Let's go back into here, show IP in brief, and this now should be 100, 100, and 100, 200. It is, fantastic. So we've actually rolled back our configuration. We got a chance to eyeball the configuration on the device and then roll back in there. But like I was just mentioning to Hank there, you've got this rollback feature. You can actually extend that within Napalm, but there is a default timer, which I believe to be around 60 seconds, but that is something that is definitely worth checking. So we'll just jump into the code here for the rollback feature. So we have exactly the same sort of thing here. And you'll see that on line 30, I was doing a merge there. Because I was only pushing the loopbacks, I, I just decided to do a quick merge. We're doing the diff again, which we saw with the negative and the positive. And if we scoot down right to the bottom, this is the new section of code where we've got the roll, the rollback. And I've got the input here. And you'll see here we've got device dot rollback, which is built into Napalm, and this rolls rolls this back. And you can see here we have in indeed got another sort of exception here where we've built in an error. So we have an error if we're rolling it forward, plus an error if we're rolling it back. So let's say that when we tried to roll the configuration back, something wasn't quite right with that. The script would then abort itself, and that change wouldn't get made. And then, as good citizens again on lines eighty four, I'm going to close my section to that device. So that here pretty much concludes all of the, um, the information for Napalm and all of the um, demonstration for Napalm. We're going to move into uh, Norna here. And now this is relatively new. And it's brought to you by the same um, devs that bought us um, at Napalm. And they invented this or built this other, um, this great Python library. And Norna is an automation framework which is written in Python. What makes Norna different is that you write it all in Python code in order to use it. This is to be compared with other frameworks which typically use their own configuration language. And we'll talk about that just up in the upcoming slide. As we talked about with Napalm, how you install it with PyPy, this can be installed again. You do exactly the same thing that we mentioned before. You install it with pip. You'll see the um, uh, version that I've put on my screen there as, as it's down, downloading here and then you'll see all the other pieces that you kind of get with it. NetWeco, Colorama and then Rumel YAML as, as well. All of these files download as well with the, with the package. And you just install that on your machine. Nice and simple. So Nornai has this concept of inventory files, but before we just get into those, I just wanted to do a quick brief sort of run of why you would use this. Nornai or Norms is from North mythology. Now, if you've ever seen a picture of me, I do look a little bit like a Viking. So this really comes into my wheelhouse when we talk about North mythology. When you look at the mythology, Norns, they spun the threads of fate that connected all beings. And it's a fantastic story if you like your North mythology and want something to read before bed. So let's say, for example, you have 10 or 20 devices and you want to connect data from each and every one of those. 
Collecting and gathering this information from all these data via some of the different automation tools can take one or two seconds. And then as you start to add that, that up to like 10, 20, even 100 devices, to run the entire job, this might take a little while to do. The difference here with Nornai is this will run this in parallelization. So it will run all of this in one go. The Nornai plugin is multiple threaded framework with inventory management, which helps operate the collection of devices. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, this differs from other automation frameworks, um, such as Ansible, where the playbooks use DSL or domain specified language based on YAML. This is all Python. Nornai works by the collections of data. In essence, it runs all these in the tasks against the devices and keeps track of these through certain threads. In the network environment, this typically means that we have devices and device inventories with the device uh, associated with each particular node of our devices. And each node could be different routers or switches, for example. Nornai ties everything together and lets us run these tasks all against, or we could run it as a subset of devices. When we start to look into how Nornai is built, we can see how we can build the subset, subset of our devices. And what I mean by subset of devices, this could be ven different vendors, uh, different flavors of iOS, say XR or something like XE, or it could be, you know, um, Edge or Core or something different uh, tertiary names that you have or end of rec switches or something like that within your, within your network. Here, what we're looking at is the um, simple inventory plugin, which uses two YAML files. And these YAML files are used and passed to create the core inventory objects based within the simple uh, inventory. So you'll notice on the left hand side, I've specified hosts YAML and groups YAML. And these are the two files. Before you go ahead and start to run it, so you have to create this inventory file. And in its uh, basic um, format, you need the host file first. The groups file is optional, um, but you do need the host, uh, host file. So let's take a quick look at those. And we'll look at them on the PowerPoint and then I'll, slow you on, I'll show you on my um, uh, atom before we run the code. So here you'll see on the left hand side I mentioned groups and I've just simply named this router because I am using this against one router device. However, you could have have this uh, group as edge or core or you could split this out into different types of vendors again or you could have routers and switches. Here you'll notice I have specified the uh, username and password and for those of you who are a little bit, you know, hey, you're you know, putting your username and password here in plain text, you can have this in a secret store of your choice in the group's YAML file as well. So you're not actually, you know, having these here in plain text. You'll see here, I am specifying again where I've mapped the port into um, uh, my vagrant instance with 22 or 22, sorry, to triple two one. The host file on the right hand side just specifies the, group, um, the groups where I specify the router and then the host name. As you'll have seen when we looked at this before, I am using the local host. So we are actually using the local host address here. I'm just going to show you this on Atom as well. So here you'll see the groups file, which was similar to what we had on the slide. And then the hosts file. Nice and easy. Okay. So I'm just going to go into the uh, Nornai demo as well real quick now. Okay, bring up my terminal. Okay, let me just clear this out. Let's have some nice space. So LS, let's take a look. Um, right, we're going to run this. I'm not using argspass on here. As before, I used argspass, but as you saw before, I'm passing all that information through the groups file or, and the host file of how to connect to my device. So I'm just going to run this real, real simple. So Nornai uh, validate, and I'm going to use the static here. I'll show you this and then we'll look at the code. So what I'm asking Nornai to do here is go into the device and issue a, a set of commands to come back and uh, give me the information about my device. So here I'm actually asking it for interface device information. And here you'll see that I'm using NetMeco to send this command. You can use the Napalm driver as well to do this. So it works really nicely. If you wanted to use Napalm, you could do for this demonstration. I just wanted to split out and use uh, NetMeco just to show the full uh, facts of uh, and the focus around Nornai. 
here you'll see I've got router uh, one change to false, which means basically I'm not changing anything on the device here. You'll see that I'm using the netmiko send command, no changes were made, and then the information is then pulled back along with the timestamp. So you'll see all of the information that I've pulled back was about the interfaces. If I jump quickly into the code here for Nornai, uh, I'm looking at this one static, you can see how we built this out. And this is built really simply with four or five lines of code. Now this becomes really powerful if you're checking different versions across your entire network here, you could have your groups file and your host file specified out for all of the network devices that you've got out there, run this simple sort of six line Python code, and it's gonna pull this all back for you, including any errors and everything you need to know about those devices. And then it's gonna print them out for you on the screen in the display that you saw on the left hand side. This is really powerful stuff. And this will, if you're pulling this against probably 10 or 20 devices, you're looking to get this back in sort of, sort of three or four, or five seconds, in my experience, I pulled this back out. So this is really cool. Let's say you wanted to do something a little bit more dynamic here. And you wanted to hand these scripts off to another team so that they were troubleshooting this information for you without having to come to the network team to give you a, say, a ticket in your queue. So I'm going to run uh, this piece of code, uh, which is the dynamic. And this was a fantastic example I found through the uh, Network to Code Slack channel for Nornai, where you can chat to the devs on, on Nornai and Napalm. And what this does is it gives you the idea to enter commands. So this is cool, right? You can pass the script over somebody else and you can ask them to run the commands. So I'm just going to do show IP in brief. And you'll notice that I am actually using the, um, not the full command. So I've cut the show down to SH, IP, interfaces, and then I've cut down the brief. And then I also want to show ver as well. And you can scale those back to the, the two commands which you're familiar with from the CLI. So this could act as a really nice run book. And here you'll see the information coming back. Here's my interfaces. And then there's my version. Fantastic. So let's just scoot up just to touch and examine this. So you'll see the information coming back. You see the root of one change. No, we didn't make any changes. The timestamp in the top there, the interfaces that we have um, on the device, the same command. Then it moves down into the show ver command. And we saw this a little bit with the napalm get facts. But in this way, we don't have to use any, any of our Python foo to break out and start printing this in different formats. This comes out in a really nice clean format. So you can imagine running this across your entire network. You could pass this out if you just wanted to get the you know, the version up here or something. But if you wanted to see the uptime on your, all of your devices or a subset of devices, this is a really nice way to do this. And you could build out your host and group files to include all of your network devices, whether this be five, 10 or 20 devices across your network. So this becomes a really powerful piece of code. And if we look about how this is actually achieved, it's done very similar, like we mentioned about how uh, Nornai can run the task command here. If we go into the dynamic one, you will see here that I'm just doing a, the, com uh, the command string and it allows me then to enter the commands um, from lines 15 and 16 here and I split them out with the comma. I could actually run a number of commands there um, I'm not sure how many you could possibly put there, but it could be quite a number. So this is a nice piece of code that you can either use yourself or hand off to other teams, you know, to check different things across the network before raising this into engineering's eye level, you know, just for validation or to see if, if there's anything wrong. So Nornai, even though it's not been around too long, I'm thinking about 12 months, it's going to move on now. I am using, uh, I think I'm using version uh, 101 at this point in time. Zero, um, version 2, I understand, is now in beta. So if you go and uh, install this, just check the version that you're using and compare the, the documentation. There has been some significant upgrades. I decided not to run the beta version just for this because of the, some of the examples that we're running, but it is always worth checking here. Hank, is there any questions on Nornai just before I close this out? So one question did just pop in as I was saying there wasn't one. Is <laughs> can you uh, so a comparison maybe between Napalm and Nornir? What what would be a benefit of using Nornir and knowing that we're short on time? Just if you could you could hone in. How, why would um, 
why might someone pick one tool over the other? Kind of where does Nornir fit into the, the value prop here? So Nornir is, is pretty much, I've used it most specifically for validation. You can use it for configuration and you can use it to actually do the configuration through task-based roles, which is really, really cool. Nornir for me is one of those things that you would add if you were using Napalm already in your network and you wanted to add a validation tool on top of Napalm, then you would add Nornir on top of that. That's the kind of main idea that I'm thinking of that when I've used Napalm and Nornai together. Great. Thanks, Drew. So as was mentioning right at the top of these, both of these are open source um, things and you can contribute to them. So the first thing that I would encourage anybody to do if you're using Napalm or Nornai, if you're on Twitter or if you're on any form of Slack channel and you're starting to use it and talk about it, is spread the word about Napalm and Nornai. The guys put a huge volume of work into here and they offer some really great support through their GitHub repo and through Slack and their documentation is absolutely fantastic. It's all worth checking out. You can go into the Network to Code Slack channel or you can go to the GitHub and you can contribute to these things, which is really, really cool. So if you wanted to, say, develop a new driver for a new piece of hardware or you wanted to implement a new feature, which isn't in either Napalm or Nornai, you can work on this and submit it and then it will get put into the code base. It's really great to think that as engineers out there, we're all contributing here to make the world of coding a better place for all of us. Likewise, if you have bugs or you come across something, you can go through the same sort of channels as well. Um, I would encourage you to go through those if you find those, to report those bugs. If you see something, it's always worth asking. Someone might have come across it before. And it's a great way to fix typos and things like that. Once those bugs and typos are founded, the guys or the devs behind both Napalm and Nornite are constantly updating the documentation. And then you can contribute, as I was mentioning before, to your plugins. And this improves the Napalm and, and Norni core. So it really goes out there to help everybody out there that's using these Python libraries. So let's just do a quick flyover. What did we talk about? We talked about what Napalm is and how we can use it against our devices, how the unified API works, what the rollback feature looks like, the merge, and the difference between the uh, replace and the merge and the discard as well. We looked at gathering facts and configuring our network with Napalm and all the different features that come along with that. We then had a quick look into Nornai. And we drive Nornai through uh, Python code as we saw that. And we looked at a quick Nornai example just to give you an idea of the power and the flexibility that Nornai has to offer when doing validation across your network and how easy it is to get up and running with this. So the webinar resource list that I've put here, you can go to the GitHub and um, look at all the um, Napalm information and resources there. And there's a link to the docs there as well. The same resources are available for Nornai as well on the GitHub repo and the docs. These are constantly maintained and you can raise your issues through the GitHub repo there and submit your changes as well. For the webinar resource list we've covered here today, we've got some introduction to Python if you wanted to build up your Python foo. And then we've got the laptop uh, setup um, idea for devs, how to set up your laptop and an intro to coding fundamentals, which walks you through all the, un all the fundamental information you'll need. If you don't want to run this in a Vagrant section like I did, we have an iOS always on Sandbox, which you could use. We have a Nexus always on Sandbox. And then just recently, we added the iOS XR programmability Sandbox as well, which has a great section on iOS XR programmability. And you can run all of these code examples against that Sandbox. All of the code that I ran today is available on my GitHub repo there, Big Evil Beard, NetDevOps, underscore Napalm, underscore Nornai. So my challenge to you is create something with Python scripts using Napalm or Nornai. Show us what you can do with this code. Some great examples of this is creating interfaces, routing, NTP configurations, ACLs, or do some validation with Nornai itself. Once you've got your project up and running, I'd really like you to submit it to Cisco Code Exchange, where you can submit your project and share this with all the, all the people across the world, and they can get a chance to see your code and work with you and collaborate with you on all your different parts of code. If you're looking for more information about NetDevOps, you can find this on the links here for the uh, NetDevOps on DevNet, the NetDevOps Live um, website, and the blogs at which we're constantly putting out. The Network Programmability Basics video course is a fantastic uh, information share to watch. You can go through all of those videos on there, and we talk a lot about uh, network programmability. If you've got any more questions, I would encourage you to stay in touch. 
There's a fantastic picture of me taking a Cisco live in Orlando there. And all of my details on the left-hand side with my GitHub repo, my Twitter handle, and my email address and Spark Chat, oh, sorry, WebEx Teams on the left-hand side. You can collaborate with us and reach out to us at all the information on the left-hand side at Cisco DevNow via Facebook, GitHub, or even Twitter. And with that, I'd like to thank you for attending today. If you've got any follow-up questions, please reach out to me. Great. Thanks, Stuart. And we will see everybody next week. Talk to you soon.